sooner or later, we're all going to make that trip. It's how you get there that counts. That's this week on Motoring 2004. SN's Motoring 2004 is brought to you by Quaker State Motor Oil, oils fine-tuned for different engines, and Midas, Total Car Care, we do that. You know, each week we like to have fun here on motoring, and I hate to get serious this week, but you know that old saying, there are only two things that we can count on in our lifetime, and that is death and taxes. Well, we know where our tax money goes, and as for the other, that's a matter of opinion. But this week, we're going to meet some men and women that, if you so choose, will be more than happy to take you on your final ride. What we're seeing here today is the 24th International Meet of the Professional Car Society. Now, to some people, they may not have heard that term before. Basically, the Professional Car Society is a preservation of uh, what we call professional chassis vehicles and they can range from uh, horse-drawn hearses to pre- and post-war automotive hearses, low and high-top ambulances, uh, limousines and flower cars. A professional car loosely defined as any type of car that has been built on an extended car chassis for the service industry. Real ambulances aren't trucks and the vehicles they use today are nothing uh, more than uh, a box put on a truck chassis, uh, a person with a back injury, they're just bouncing over every bump, whereas in the days of a professional chassis ambulance, whether it be built on a Cadillac, Pontiac, or Oldsmobile chassis and extended, these cars for the most part, the suspension uh, in a lot of the cars was air ride, so if you went over a bump, the car took the ride, not or the bump and not the patient. This is a 1919 REO Speedwagon hearse. It was first used in Bertie Township in the fall of 1918. It was used to replace the horse-drawn hearse that I have in existence at my own place now. It uh, was converted, it was bought as a chassis and converted by the Finch Coach Company into a hearse in 1918. It was used as a horse drawn or as a hearse for 15 years and then it was converted into a pickup truck for delivering furniture. I bought it in 1995, sight unseen from an estate, and then searched for two years finding parts, and then converted it back into a hearse. It took me three years in total the project. Now, isn't there a band called REO Speedwagon? REO Speedwagon was named after the car. The engine is the original engine. I had it rebuilt. Uh, my friend Don Belfry across the street. Uh, rebuilt the engine for me in 1998. We uh, obviously had some time getting parts for it because this, the uh, parts department at Rio was closed, but uh, he found out through friends of his that the um, valves from a 1955 Massey Ferguson tractor would also fit a 1919 Rio, and that's why when we started it sounds more like a tractor than a car. It's a four-cylinder engine, I believe it's a 25 horsepower. This is the original registration plate for this vehicle. If you really read it closely, you'll see that it says over speeding, over loading, or the use of solid tires will void the warranty. And two lines below that, it'll say that uh, maximum speed is 22 miles per hour. I've never gone over 22 miles an hour because I really didn't want to void the warranty. I don't think about what it was used for. I really enjoy the look of the vehicle and the local history surrounded by it. People like to look at these things. They're fascinated by, by the lights. Uh, one of my vehicles, which is a 71 uh, SNS Medic Mark I high top ambulance, which was originally in service in Myerstown, Pennsylvania until 1988, has 24 red lights and four sirens on it. Extremely impressive looking car. And when people see that, 
uh, and they see the color scheme, they're immediately attracted to it. And, and if they can be convinced that uh, this ambulance has probably saved a lot more lives and carried people to a hospital and it served a useful purpose, then they begin to break down those barriers of fear and, and appreciate them for what they were originally built for. If I'm going to complain about the government, I better pull these pants up a little higher. More later on Kenzie's Corner. Since 1999, compact SUV sales have more than tripled, so it's not difficult to understand why Nissan is launching this all-new X-Trail. And one of the more interesting points is it's a vehicle unique to Canada, which is a refreshing change from the norm. The reason I say it is a refreshing change is that when a vehicle comes from another part of the world, it invariably goes to the States before coming to Canada, if it actually gets here. The fact that the X-Trail has been serving other countries for a number of years is another good thing in my book, as it does not follow Nissan's current edgy styling philosophy. As such, it's an attractive rig that speaks to the rugged lifestyle preferred by its intended buyers. The inside of the X-Trail has been very nicely finished, with the materials used adding a sort of rugged appeal to the interior. There are a couple of things worthy of note. One rather dumb, and that's the bottle holder that comes with a separate cap holder. Nissan claims it as a world first. Why? I've no idea. The other one is more significant. The center stack houses everything of note. Gauges up top, radio in the middle, climate controls at the bottom. Now what this does, it allows them to switch this vehicle from a left-hand drive vehicle to a right-hand drive vehicle without having to replace the entire dash. Basically, they take the module from this side and put it over here, and they take the passenger side airbag, stick it in front of me, and Bob's your uncle. When it comes to ride and handling, the X-Trail is surprisingly well balanced as the strut-based suspension is compliant enough to cushion the rigors of a rough road, yet firm enough to control body roll. Indeed, it's such that there are only two very minor hiccups. The steering is a tad vague on centre, and there's a hint of trailing throttle oversteer. Whenever the gas is lifted heading into a corner, the nose tends to tuck in, which makes the X-Trail feel a little light until the suspension hunkers down. It then rides out a fast corner with very little drama. Through the pylons, it put on a strong showing that easily bettered its key competition. Likewise, the standard anti-lock brakes. They put a quick halt to the proceedings without any unwanted electronic intervention. You know, the back end of this X-Trail has been nicely thought through, at least for the most part. To begin with, with the seats up, you get 29 cubic feet of space. Fold the 60-40 split folding rear seats flat, and that grows to almost 73. You also get a privacy cover, but the best part of all, the floor is made of a hard, durable, washable plastic, so you can put dirty items in there without destroying it. There is, however, one minor foible. This back glass should open independently of the tailgate. X-Trail's all-wheel drive system uses an electromechanical center clutch to divvy up the power. It also allows the system to take a proactive approach to the way it functions. When the automatic mode is selected, all of the power is fed to the road through the front wheels. Now, should they slip or the system detects the likelihood of slippage because of a rapid throttle input, it begins to shuttle the power rearwards, ending up at a 50-50 split front to rear. For those times when a fixed split is really needed, the system can be locked. All of that said, the lack of a low-range gear set limits any off-roading to some fairly mild stuff. You know, all of that technical double talk would count for nothing if the system didn't work. In the X-Trails case, it does so very effectively and it boils down to one simple thing. The system is very quick at picking up on a loss of traction and equally quick at firing the power rearward. The bottom line? Well, the transition from front-wheel drive to all-wheel drive is all but seamless, making it one of the best in this category. X-Trail's power comes from the same 2.5-litre 4 that sees duty in the Altima. As such, it pumps out 165 horsepower and 170 pounds-feet of torque at 4,000 RPM. While the initial launch is a little soft, it picks up nicely 
as soon as the revs pass 3000 rpm. At this point the variable valve timing starts to do its thing which brings a strong mid-range and a commendably quiet work ethic. Five-speed manual or four-speed automatic transmissions are available depending upon the model. While the stick does make better use of the power it feels as though it needs another cog at highway speeds and so the automatic is the better choice. It brings crisp shifts and a willing kickdown so overall performance barely suffers. The X-Trail, you know, is a decent package, and while it's more soft-roader than it is off-roader, it comes with one of the better all-wheel drive systems, it's got plenty of room, it's comfortable, but most importantly, it's powerful without being a gas hog. Now you add that lot together, and you have a recipe for success, especially considering the current gas prices. Our Midas tip of the week concerns checking fluid levels on a four-wheel drive or all-wheel drive vehicle. You may remember last week we talked about checking fluids on a front-wheel drive car. On most front-wheel drive cars, all your fluid levels are checked in the engine bay from under the hood. On a four-wheel drive or all-wheel drive, you make the engine oil level check and many fluid level checks from under the hood, but you also have to check driveline fluids, which in most cases are checked from underneath the vehicle. Usually two driven axles, a transfer case, and if it's a standard transmission, transmission fluid level as well will, will be checked from underneath the vehicle on those four-wheel drive or all-wheel drive vehicles. On a four-wheel drive truck or all-wheel drive sport utility, you'll have two driven axles, the front and rear axle with lubricants in them as well. You remove a pipe plug just like this one and the fluid level lubricant should be up to the bottom of this filler hole. In most cases you're using ADW90 gear oil but consult your owner's manual. Now in this case I've got to stick my pinky finger in there to find the fluid level and it's way down. I've got to reach a long way in there so it's probably down somewhere around here. This axle needs to be topped up with the appropriate fluid. It's very critical that the vehicle be level and check periodically for the, for the important driveline fluids because by the time you hear some noise from one of those driveline components like a howling rear axle or a noisy transfer case, it's already too late to top up fluid and fix the problem. You've got to maintain the fluid levels adequately in order to protect those components. Most transfer cases only hold a couple of liters of, fl of fluid and most drive axles only two or three liters of fluid as well. If it's low, you can do some really expensive damage to those driveline components. That's your Midas tip of the week. You know, a lot of people have expressed concern about what happens when you run the smart car, which is barely longer than an F-150 is wide, into a full-size North American car. I mean, when I was in Stuttgart, the results of the crash test absolutely amazed me, and that's not putting too fine a point on it. Basically, I expected to see the Smart get rolled up into a tight little ball of metal and plastic. After the impact, nothing could have been further from the truth. The Smart car really did withstand the impact remarkably well. There was an awful lot of bang, there was an awful lot of smoke from the airbags, but when all the dust settled, the smart car, it was quite badly bent. But you know what? Nothing had intruded into the passenger car cell. And the thing that really did amaze me most of all was that the dummy sitting in the driver's side, his knees hadn't even touched the dash. Now, I'd have bet good money that that was the first thing that would happen to him. Kneecap himself right on the dash. And it's for that reason that smart have put polystyrene in behind the dash, designed to protect the knees. As it turns out, they really don't need it. As far as I'm concerned, all the concerns that people have about crashing a small car into a big one, especially one as small as a Smart, well, after witnessing the crash test, those reservations, I think, quite frankly, they're unfounded. This is the Saturn Curve. 
The Saturn Curve's contemporary design demonstrates what a 2 plus 2 sport coupe may look like on the Kappa architecture. This is a new breed of sports car with unique use of colors, materials, and lighting. For example, we wanted to create the look of a floating roof panel. So we concealed the roof pillars with a wraparound canopy of glass. The front and rear clearly communicates the identity of Saturn. For me, Saturn is the car for contemporary design. So my goal is to uh, combine the contemporary Saturn design icon with a traditional sports car uh, profile, proportion. That was my basic concept of this exterior design of Saturn show car. As we spend more time in our cars, uh, a warm and inviting environment becomes more important um, as, as we uh, spend a lot more time. I mean, I'm not talking just getting in it and then that's it. I mean, I wanted something to like carry on that warmth and uh, to keep you interested in the, in the interior. Time to wrap up our long-term Mazda 6. Since it was our car of the year in 2003, we had great expectations and the Mazda did not disappoint. Our sport model came equipped with a lively V6, taunt chassis and good looks at half the cost of its German counterparts. Now the base Mazda is powered by a 2.3 liter four cylinder with 160 horsepower and is more than adequate. Whichever you choose, the Mazda 6 comes loaded with standard equipment, including 60-40 split folding rear seats. The ride is smooth and it handles great. In six months of living together, there are few complaints, although it took almost that long to find the seat warmer switch. Even the manual didn't help. And we did have minor cosmetic problems with the excessive brake dust buildup on the front wheels. But you know, Mazda set out to challenge the status quo, and it succeeded. Usually at this time we head to the Quaker State Garage and join Bill Gardner, but as you're about to see, Bill recently has become a frequent traveler. Good morning, 839 New Stock 1010 CFRB Toronto. We're happy to uh, have in studio with us this morning Bill Gardner from TSN's Motoring 2004. Good morning, Bill. Thanks for having me in, John. It's great to be here. Well, after all these telephone calls, nice to meet you in the flesh. May Phil's great at it. I mean, he's not only just because he's a mechanic, but he's always, and he is an average guy as well. You know, he loves cars. He loves mechanics. He loves dealing with the, the basic things to do with cars. And I think more importantly, he loves sharing information with people. And Bill understands that not everyone is as smart as he is when it comes to auto mechanics and that the average person really needs to hear the basic information. And Bill's great at just relaying that information to our listeners. It's, it's all part of this Be Car Care Aware program. The Automotive Industries Association has determined that there's annually $2 billion of non-performed vehicle maintenance going on in Canada. So what I've been doing is talking about just how important it is to maintain your vehicle because people are losing out on a lot of things. First of all, they're operating possibly a vehicle that's not as safe to, to operate when they're not maintaining it. Uh, they're losing out on fuel economy. They may be polluting the environment by a car that's not as sharply tuned. They're losing on trade-in value and resale value on their, on their vehicles and they're losing some of the driving enjoyment that they could have from driving driving a properly maintained vehicle. We thought it was a good time to take a look at your car, give it an inspection. For that, we got Bill Gardner. He is an interprovincial A-class auto mechanic. That's right. Congratulations. Thank you, thank you. May is National Car Care Month. So what I'm doing is I go to each city and I, I go to a, a morning TV show, usually an AM station in the morning as well, a new news show at a CTV station, and usually in the afternoon, maybe the FM equivalent, and then a uh, newspaper as well. Talk about the importance of uh, people maintaining their cars and all the good things that happen to them when they keep their car properly. Properly maintained. Most cars are pretty easy to do an inspection on. Every time I go to an airport, I land in a different city, I talk to the limo guys and the taxi guys, every single one of them on the ride back, I ask them about their vehicle. The guys at Toronto, I was in a, a 2003 Lincoln the other day and the guy had 335,000 K on a 2003 already. Just goes to show you, and, and some of those uh, vehicles in the Toronto fleet, seven, eight, nine hundred thousand K is nothing on those vehicles. And the reason they last is these guys are on top of their maintenance. You know, they know, they know how important it is to them. If they neglect maintenance, it's going to hit them hard in the pocketbook. They want that vehicle to last indefinitely. And the vehicles 
are made now, the powertrains, engine and trannies, by and large, if you look after them, change those fluids and service them properly, they'll last the life of the vehicle. this year I drove from Toronto to Calgary just to watch a hockey game how Canadian is that we spent most of our time on the Trans Canada Highway now this was supposed to be a federally supported endeavor designed to link the country from east to west now, parts of this road are in great shape there's one stretch out of Regina well billiard tables should be as smooth when you enter Manitoba the road becomes a four-lane divided highway the median is so wide you can barely see across it but there are parts of this road that are an absolute disgrace. It looks like something out of downtown Baghdad. I was driving in a Mini, and I had to gear down to crawl out of some of these potholes. They're not only uncomfortable, they're dangerous. You could blow a tire, you could bend your suspension. It not only costs you money, it could end up costing you your life. Now, the feds take money out of our pockets for federal fuel tax. Now, I've got no problem with that. Raise the tax, get the SUVs off the road, but that's another comment. But surely, some of the money should go back in to the highways. Now, all levels of government are playing games with us. The feds download responsibility to the provinces. The provinces offload stuff to the municipalities who don't have enough money to pay for these things. But the roads are the lifeline of our country. They've got to be fixed. The politicians have to stop passing the buck, particularly when that buck belongs to us. I'm Jim Kenzie. Before we go, I'd like to show you the car that we fell in love with at the Hearst Convention earlier in the program. It's a 1959 Cadillac Superior, the last year of those beautiful tail fins when a Cadillac did not need a nameplate. And they tell me this Caddy had more chrome on it than any other production vehicle. Under the hood, a four-barrel 390 V8 with 325 horses. You know, the cars we drive in today may be safer, but they sure weren't as much fun. That's it for now. We'll see you next time out as we continue to bring you more stories about cars and the people who drive them. I'm a customizer. I picture in my mind what I like and uh, I just create from there. TSN's Motoring 2004 has been brought to you by Quaker State Motor Oil, oils fine-tuned for different engines, and Midas, Total Car Care. We do that.